Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about mirror, motivic mirror symmetry for Higgs bundles, and this is joint work with uh, Simon Pepe and Lerler. So first of all, I'm going to introduce the moduli spaces that we're interested in, and these are moduli spaces of Higgs bundles on a curve. So for me, C is going to be a smooth, projective, geometrically connected curve um, over a field K, which at the moment can be arbitrary. Later on, there'll be some restrictions on K. And um, I'm going to fix a um, some invariants for bundles. So I'm going to fix a rank N and a degree D. And always I'm going to assume that these are co-prime. Uh, and this is going to mean that the moduli spaces that I'm looking at are smooth. So I'll come to that in a minute. So classically, um, before you did Higgs bundles, you did vector bundles. So I'm going to talk a little bit about vector bundles. So there's sort of two ways of um, going about moduli spaces. Either you can... Um, work with a stack um, uh, and not get a, a scheme, or you can uh, impose semi-stability and you get a moduli space. Um, and because we've, so we're going to take the, the scheme approach uh, and get the moduli space. So um, there's a moduli space N of um, stable uh, vector bundles. Um, and it's actually a smooth projective variety because of this um, uh, co-dimension, this uh, co-prime um, assumption. And um, you can calculate its dimension um, from Riemann rock because um, so um, actually the, the, the tangent bundle is given by the self X ones by deformation theory. And also it's um, to relate to Higgs bundles, the cotangent uh, space is given by then um, by applying said duality to this X self X ones, you get Homs from E to E tensor omega C. And this is precisely what's called a Higgs field. So it's a map from E to E tensor omega C, the canonical bundle. And so it's sort of like a twisted endomorphism of E. Let me just um, briefly say a word relating this to the stack of all vector bundles. So you have um, a stack of all vector bundles, and then um, sitting inside here, you have the um, semi-stable ones. Um, and this is the same as the stable ones, um, as I said, because the rank and the degree are co-prime. And um, uh, then in this case, because uh, we're in this co-prime setting, um, actually, um, the automorphisms of stable bundles are just given by scalar multiples of the identity. And so um, this, this map here is actually a GM job. So in general, um, if you didn't have this assumption, then this map here would be um, a good moduli space or adequate moduli space map in the sense of uh, alpha. So um, yeah, it's not going to be too important what semi-stability is. So I've just recalled it here for those of you who haven't seen it, but it's... Um, uh, it, it's an open condition which involves checking a inequality of um, slopes, which is just the degree divided by the rank, um, for all subbundles. Um, and so, actually, um, this is somehow this um, this open piece inside here is the start of a um, stratification of bun by hard and narrow Siemens types. So you sort of have a canonical destabilizing filtration uh, that you can stratify by. Okay, let's come to Higgs bundles now. So um, then. The moduli space of uh, Higgs bundles, which consists of a vector bundle and then a Higgs field, um, is denoted M. And by what we described up above, uh, the cotangent bundle to N sits inside uh, M as a actually as an open um, subvariety. Um, but now um, uh, the difference between N and M is that N was projective, but M is not. It's only quasi-projective, but it's still smooth. And um, maybe a word about what stability means here for Higgs bundles. Um, instead, you just check this inequality um, for all subbundles which are preserved by this Higgs field. So these are called Higgs subbundles. Okay. Um, let me talk about the geometric features of um, the Higgs moduli space. So first of all, um, over the complex numbers, it's a non-compact hyperkähler manifold. Um, but actually, cohomologically, it behaves like it's compact. Um, and this is due to um, what's called a semi-projective uh, scaling action, which was first actually studied by Hitchin and then later by various other people, Simpson and Housel. Um, what does it do? Well, um, it just scales the Higgs field. So you have an action of the multiplicative group of your field uh, on the uh, Higgs bundle moduli space, uh, and it's just scaling the Higgs field. And um, I'm going to... Um, we're we're going to return to this action later on, so this is uh, maybe important to keep in mind. Another very important geometric feature is that you have this Hitchin vibration, um, which is just given by associating to your Higgs bundle um, the characteristic polynomial of the Higgs field. Um, and this is a proper map 
And the interesting thing is that the generic fibers are actually abelian varieties. They look like um, Jacobians on an associated curve, which is called the spectral curve. We're not going to um, need anything about the spectral curve, but the important thing is that these generic fibers are abelian varieties. And so actually Jacobians. Um, there's also, but uh, so I, I should say that of course you have these non-generic fibers, which are actually going to be singular. Um, yeah, there's versions for other reductive groups. So you can think of um, vector bundles as being principal GLN bundles. Um, and so if you take a group a G not equal to GLN, then there are, there's also a notion, an abstract notion of uh, G Higgs bundles. And um, I'm not going to give that definition, but we're going to see it for two particular groups. Um, so I'm interested in the groups SLN and PGLN, which are dual Langlands groups. So um, you're going to have um, a Hitchin map uh, and also a, a, so a Higgs moduli space and a, a Hitchin base, just like in the case that we had here. But now I'm going to kind of index it by G when I want to uh, emphasize that we're, we're not working with GLN ones. And actually, let's um, talk about these two special cases, then SLN and PGLN Higgs bundles. Um, so for the SLN ones, so strictly speaking, um, an SLN vector bundle is um, a vector bundle with trivial determinant, but then that would mean that the degree is zero and that would violate my co-prime condition that I want. So instead we're going to cheat and we're going to say that the determinant is some fixed line bundle L of degree D. Um, and so um, we impose that condition. And then also on the Higgs field, you have to impose that it's trace free. And this cuts out a, um, a, a sub variety inside the Higgs moduli space. And this is actually still smooth. And it comes with its own um, Hitchin map uh, to its Hitchin base. And um, yes, uh, it's also, um, so there's actually an action by tensoring by line bundles on um, the moduli space for GLN Higgs bundles. And then if you look at the N torsion inside that group, then it acts on the moduli space of SL Higgs bundles. So you're just um, tensoring your um, vector bundle E by um, an N torsion element here. And then actually it preserves the determinant still because, uh, because of this element being N torsion. And this, this group gamma, this N torsion in the Jacobian is going to play a very important role in this talk, which is why I gave it a, um, a special uh, notation. Um, so uh, PGLN Higgs bundles, you can construct their moduli space as actually quotients either of the SLN Higgs moduli space or the GLN Higgs moduli space. It's a bit like you can realize PGLN as a quotient of either um, GLN by GM or SLN by mu n. And so there's sort of um, different things that you can do here. So in the SLN case, you just quotient by this action of gamma. And these square brackets mean that I'm taking the um, quotient as a stack. So I want to consider this as a smooth um, orbifold, so a Deleen Mumford stack, because its um, coarse moduli space is actually singular. So I, I don't want to work with a singular thing. I want to think of it as a stack, um, uh, and um, then it's smooth. And it also comes actually with a um, gerb, which is um, coming from essentially the um, universal family um, uh, on the or, well, I guess the stack on the SL and Higgs moduli space. So the automorphism groups of um, these um, stable um, SLN bundles are actually mu n. And so you have a mu n gerb there, and then you quotient by the action of gamma, and you get an induced mu, mu n gerb on um, this uh, PGLN and Higgs moduli space. And this will also be very important in what comes below. Okay, so let's um, now we've got the prerequisites about Higgs bundles. Um, let me switch to mirror symmetry. Um, and we're just going to focus on the case of SLN and PGLN. Um, and now we're going to work over the complex numbers. So um, let's um, first, let's discuss the sort of general case. So um, it turns out that Langland's dual groups have isomorphic Hitchin bases. So um, the two Langland's dual groups that I'm interested in are SLN and PGLN. And so you can see their Hitchin maps going to the same base. So I'll call this one HL and this one H bar in similar notation to the moduli spaces. Um, and um, as we saw in the GLN case, the fibers were abelian varieties. And it actually turns out that um, Hazel and Thaddeus showed that the generic fibers of um, these two maps are actually dual abelian varieties. So on the SL side, you actually have a prim variety. And um, on the right-hand side, you have the prim variety and then quotiented by this gamma, the N torsion in the Jacobian. Um, 
And actually, there's more that's expected. So there's, uh, there's um, sort of an expectation that there should be a derived equivalence. So the Mukai derived equivalence between dual abelian varieties, which are the fibers of these Hitchin maps, um, should actually extend to a derived um, equivalence between, so um, the derived category of coherent sheaves on the SLN Higgs moduli space. And then, um, so it's not quite coherent sheaves on the TGLM1. You actually have to twist by this gerb. So you get a notion of twisted uh, coherent sheaves. And this, this isomorphism should be actually relative to the Hitchin base, the shared Hitchin base that they have. And actually, Donaghy and Pantev show that this is the case. And in fact, more generally for a general um, reductive group G and its Langlands dual. Um, and this is true over an open set of the Hitchin base. So that uh, it's, it's, it's not known in general. So then um, uh, what are some sort of concrete uh, statements that we can make about mirror symmetry? Well, um, Hausland Thaddeus conjectured a, a topological version of mirror symmetry. Uh, and um, this was proved by um, Grokenick, Wies and Ziegler for um, Hodge numbers, and then by Maulik and Shen for pure Hodge structures. And it's an, uh, the following isomorphism here. Um, which is an isomorphism between the um, singular cohomology of the SLN Higgs moduli space and the orbifold cohomology of the PGLN Higgs moduli space, but twisted by this gerb. So I'm going to explain what this right hand side is now. So, yeah, this right hand side is this orbifold cohomology and it's twisted by uh, this gerb. So if you didn't have a, a gerb that you were twisting by, then orbifold cohomology is essentially the cohomology of the um, inertia stack, but um, I, I don't think there's such an elegant way to define it when you have this job. But so how um, Hausen and Thaddeus defined it was that um, you look at the um, action of this group uh, gamma again. Um, and um, so what do we do? So first for each uh, little gamma and gamma, you can consider the uh, fixed locus inside the SLN Higgs moduli space. And you're wanting to take sort of cohomology of that, but um, there's some extra decorations, which I'm going to explain. So um, what do we have? So firstly, um, uh, gamma um, acts on this M gamma, this fixed locus. Um, and so it's cohomology decomposed into different pieces. And I'm going to take the piece which corresponds to the character kappa gamma, which corresponds to gamma under the V pairing, okay? And then there's a slight shift going on as well by a codimension. So we have a D gamma here, which is a codimension. So this is a shift on the cohomological degree and then also a, a Tate twist here. Um, and this um, codimension is uh, coming from this third part. So we have the original SLN Hitchin uh, map. Um, and then what we do is we restrict that to um, M gamma, so the fixed locus, and we let its image uh, we call it A gamma. Uh, and then this sits inside here as a closed uh, sub variety and uh, its co-dimension is D gamma. And that's that's what's involved in these twists. Um, okay, so that, that's just the definition of the um, this right-hand side. It's a little bit uh, technical, but it, the main thing is that it decomposes over, you sum over uh, gamma. But actually, the left-hand side also decomposes as a sum over gamma, or, well, gamma hat, so it's character group. Um, uh, and that's because you have um, the gamma action. Uh, so let me write it. So gamma is also acting on the SLN Higgs moduli space, and so you get a weight decomposition for that. Um, and so you decompose it into the characters of um, gamma, and you get the different pieces. And so actually, the uh, above isomorphism star, this one here, follows by summing isomorphisms, one for each little gamma in big gamma. Um, and so we you prove um, isomorphisms like this for each um, little gamma in big gamma, uh, and, and then you sum them up, and that's how you get this um, result. And so let, let me um, so let me go back to the statement here. Um, so there were, there were two different proofs. The original one came by um, uh, Sort of using uh, periodic techniques and then the second one is more using perverse sheaves and was much more geometric and so um, I'm going to talk about the second approach because it's kind of a model for what we do so let me just say a few words on what Malik and Shen do so they construct um, this isomorphism here from actually an isomorphism relative to the Hitchin base so this is similar to what you'd expect that the derived equivalence is supposed to be relative to the Hitchin base um, and they use perverse sheaves, as I said, and the decomposition theorem and an analysis of supports. 
Now, um, the the Hitchin map is it has very complicated uh, geometry, and so actually they simplify it by working with what are called um, d-twisted Higgs bundles, um, where d is a divisor of degree larger than two g minus two. And so then actually the Hitchin map becomes uh, a little bit easier to deal with. And they use um, then vanishing cycles arguments to pass from D Higgs bundles to uh, Higgs bundles for the canonical divisor, which are the classical ones that we were interested in. And uh, the idea is that what you want to do is you want to subtract points from D so that you get to a divisor of degree 2G minus 2. And um, this, this subtracting of points is done using vanishing cycles. And um, so how do you construct this isomorphs and then in the case of D-twisted Higgs bundles, well, it's actually constructed following work of Ngo and Yun using a sort of endoscopic correspondence. So actually, we, we, um, we're going to mimic these constructions in a motivic world, but I'm not going to go too much into the details. So, um, but let me explain the goal of what we wanted to do. So we wanted to prove a motivic um, refinement of topological mirror symmetry, where here by motive, I mean, in the sense originally envisaged by Grothendieck. So, um, and this was realized by Wojewodski's triangulated category of uh, motivic sheaves. And this, uh, the, this category, um, so it encodes um, cohomology groups. So for example, over the complex numbers, it encodes the singular cohomology and its mixed hoc structure, but it also encodes things like uh, alladic cohomology and its Galois representation structure. It also encodes um, algebraic Durand cohomology, and it also encodes algebraic cycles. So I'm going to say a lot more about motifs in a second, I just want to state our main result and then we'll get on to motifs. So the main result is what we call motivic mirror symmetry. Um, and now we let K be an algebraically closed field of um, characteristic zero. And um, so actually we need to work with slightly larger coefficients than just the rational numbers. So you have to add a primitive nth root of unity. And this is um, because we're working with this n torsion in the um, Jacobian and we want to decompose the motive for this gamma action. Um, and once we take these coefficients um, uh, and we consider motives over K, so we have this category, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about soon, then there's an isomorphism of twisted orbifold motifs between the motive of the SLN Higgs moduli space and the orbifold motive of the PGLN Higgs moduli space, again, twisted by this gerb. Um, and as a corollary of this, because um, motives also encode things like um, child groups, at least when you're working with something smooth, we actually get motivic mirror symmetry for twisted or before child groups. So, um, which was something that was not known before. So um, that's that's kind of a concrete thing. And this gives a lot more evidence towards mirror symmetry because before it was just a, uh, um, a statement about Betty cohomology, but now we get various different cohomologies and also child groups. Okay, so that was the um, long introduction. Um, now I'm going to start talking about motives. Are there any questions? No, okay, I will carry on. So as I said, yes, this was originally something that um, was envisaged by Grothendieck um, as a universal cohomology theory, but that also encodes things like um, algebraic cycles. Um, uh, and it's so K varieties in general. So there's quite a good theory of pure motifs for uh, smooth projective varieties, but um, uh, the idea was to extend this to all varieties, and this is very useful for us because actually the Higgs moduli space is um, is not um, uh, smooth projective; it's just a smooth and quasi projective. Um, and it sort of one of the best realizations was. Uh, International coefficients in this talk, um, together with a functor which goes from varieties over k. So actually, you can extend this to stacks over k um, to um, dm, this uh, category of motives, um, and this realizes a well a lot of growth in Deke's vision. So actually, um, conjecturally, there should be an abelian category of mixed motives uh, over k, and the idea is that um, so it was uh, no one could find this category, so people instead tried to look for its derived category. Um, and um, this is, so this notation is very much suggestive of a derived category, but it's not actually a derived category. It's constructed as a localization of a derived category. So it's a triangulated category. 
Um, and, but conjecturally, there should be a T structure on there whose heart is this abelian category of mixed motus, but that, that's kind of the part of Grothendieck's vision that is not realized, but almost everything else is. So um, let me um, give the basic properties. So firstly, it's a um, tensor category. So um, you uh, can tense them to motifs, and that corresponds to the motif of the Cartesian product. So you have a conic isomorphism. And the unit is then given by the motif of spec K. Then um, one of the conditions that's imposed uh, on this category is that you have A1 homocopy invariance. So I, I, I should say, actually, um, so this, this is a, a covariant functor here. So this is behaving, this is a bit like a homology theory. So this is the homological motor. Um, and so the, the um, motif of um, a vector bundle, um, E over X, is just the same as the motif of X. So that's, it built into the construction of this category. And then um, you also have things like uh, the projective bundle polynomials. So if I projectivize this vector bundle, then the motive of the projectivized vector bundle is the motive of the base turns to the motive of the fiber. And most of the projective spaces are very nice. They're just like the cohomology of a projective space decomposes into uh, these one-dimensional pieces. Is the, the, these, uh, this is the same thing here. So we have, um, uh, these different Tate twists, um, which can all be constructed from um, the first Tate twist Q1, which is just sort of um, the other direct factor in the motive of P1, and then you just take tensor products of these. And these are the basic building blocks of motives of Pn, um, uh, these, these pure Tate twists. Okay, and uh, also, um, uh, if you have a closed uh, subvariety, so Z inside um, X, and Z and X are both smooth, then um, you have a distinguished triangle relating the motif of X and the motif of Z and its open complement X minus Z, um, where one of these Tate twists appears. So here, this is the motif of Z tensor with uh, QC, the Tate twist associated to the co-dimension C. So it's a bit like the long exact sequence in cohomology associated to such a uh, smooth closed uh, pair. But the important thing is that this is a um, distinguished triangle which isn't necessarily split. So this is the difference between, um, for example, working with um, the growth and deep ring of varieties where the word motif is also used. So in, in the growth and deep ring of varieties, you consider um, isomorphism class of varieties and then you mod out by these cut and paste relations which say that the class of a, um, a variety um, is equal to, so if you've got a subvariety, the, the, the sum of the class of that subvariety and its open complement. And uh, this is not true at all in motifs, but I mean, this enables you to get your hands on deeper invariants of things like um, algebraic cycles, um, the non-splitting of this. And yeah, let me say, I, I have mentioned that this is related to algebraic cycles and how, well, um, you can realize Chow groups as Hom groups in this category DM. So um, if X is smooth, then it's I child groups. So here we have to tensor with Q because I was working in this Q linear category DM. I was working with Q coefficients, but there is actually a version for integral coefficients. Um, uh, and it goes from the, um, so it's just the homs in this category DM from the motif of X to this Tate twist given by the corresponding I here, the same I as here. And also it was supposed to relate to various cohomology theories and how it does this is via realization functors. So you have um, the Betty, Duram, and Aladic cohomology all factor via this uh, motif functor associating to a variety its motif. Um, so for example, um, uh, for a, a subfield of C, there's a Betty realization, which is a map going from the um, derived category of, uh, sorry, the um, Vygotsky's category uh, DM to the derived category of Q vector spaces. Um, such that the sort of natural uh, map like this factors via uh, M. Okay, um, yeah, I also wanted to say that there's a notion of relative motives as well. So if you're working with varieties over S, there are actually categories of relative motives over S. And if you've got a morphism between two um, uh, varieties or, or schemes, then you can um, associate a uh, pullback and pushback forward functor. And actually there's exceptional versions of these and um, a tensor product and an internal home. So this is what's called the six operations here. So you have these two and these extra four here. And, and, and that's another way of thinking about motives is um, uh, using these um, six operations. 
Um, and uh, another thing is that um, also uh, an alternative way to think about DM is rather than thinking about a triangulated category, is to think about an infinity category. So you can actually, it's very flexible. You can do a lot of operations in this category DM. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say as my brief introduction to motives. And now um, I wanted to turn to an outline of the proof. Um, yeah. So um, I, the, the motivic mirror symmetry isomorphism in our main theory is just as exactly in the case for the topological version of mirror symmetry. It's obtained by summing up isomorphisms over all um, gamma in gamma. So, and these isomorphisms look like, well, you take the motive of the fixed locus. So remember, this was the fixed locus inside the SLM Higgs moduli space. Um, and you take its motive and then you take some um, weight space piece. So some piece in the isotypical decomposition associated with this action. And then there's a twist by one of these Tate twists. And this was the co-dimension, if you remember. So the important thing is, so this is the gamma in here. And then this is the corresponding character. And we're taking that piece. And um, we want to show that, and then there's this twist by the co-dimension, and we want to show that that's isomorphic to the most of the SL uh, Higgs moduli space, and we just take the uh, invariant piece here. And if you sum up over the um, left-hand side, you get the orbifold motif of the PGLN Higgs moduli space with respect to this gerb. And if you sum over the right-hand side, then you get the um, motive of the SLM Higgs moduli space. And so that gives you your motivic mirror symmetry statement. Yeah, oh, sorry, I did recall the um, various notation here. So yeah, we have this very pairing which associates to um, an element little gamma in gamma, uh, kappa gamma, the, the corresponding character. Um, and yeah, this M gamma was the fixed locus. But um, because um, gamma is abelian, so gamma still acts on this and it will also act on its motif. Um, and you can take different pieces corresponding to the different characters. And yes, the D gamma was the co-dimension of this, this inclusion of the different Hitchin bases. I should say that this, this, um, um, this Hitchin base here for gamma is just the image um, of M gamma under HL. So it's not, there's not a gamma action and you're not taking the gamma invariant, you're not taking the gamma invariant piece um, or the gamma fixed points. Okay, so let me talk about the proof and there's um, sort of two parts to it. So the first part is um, uh, to lift everything that Malik and Shen do to motives. Um, uh, but we can do this and we construct a morphism, but we can't necessarily show that it's an isomorphism. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, Construct firstly, so I, I told you that the Malik and Shen isomorphism came from an isomorphism relative to the Hitchin base. And so we also construct a morphism relative to the Hitchin base um, and um, such that it's Betty realization is the isomorphism of Malik and Shen. But we don't know if this is an isomorphism or not. Um, actually, I should be clear about that right now. But um, that's a big mystery. Um, I, I expect it should be, but we don't know how to prove it. But um, this is in this relative setting, um, but if you um, push forward to spec K, then you get an absolute morphism, which uh, is this alpha gamma. So this is precisely what I wrote up above, apart from it's just a morphism rather than an isomorphism. And we want to show this as an isomorphism. So actually there's quite a bit of um, formality that goes into this um, part A because you have to do everything that they did but in the setting of motives. So there's various things involving motivic correspondences and um, vanishing cycles for motives, uh, which we actually had to use vanishing cycles for uh, uh, motivic vanishing cycles for stacks. So um, let me see, I think I wrote a few things. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we also have to use these D-twisted Higgs bundles as well. So yeah, firstly, we construct this, um, this relative one, B, B to gamma. Um, and it's first constructed in the case of D-twisted Higgs bundles um, using a, a motivic correspondence. And then, yeah, we go from D-twisted Higgs bundles to uh, classical Higgs bundles using motivic vanishing cycles for certain stacks. So again, you want to sort of subtract points from D. So you go from D to D minus P. 
And actually, um, what this means is that you're really looking at the stack of Higgs bundles um, over a point, uh, P and C. And because you're looking at SLN Higgs bundles, well, that's just a trace-free matrix. So you get something in the Liadra of SLN, and then you're quotienting out by SLN. So this is the stack of uh, Higgs bundles over a point. So this is somehow the difference between D Higgs bundles and D minus P Higgs bundles. And then the um, sort of the regular function that you use to whose critical locus cuts out um, the, the modular space that you're interested in is just given by the uh, killing form uh, on SLM. So uh, and it essentially um, it's not too complicated because it just boils down to computing motivic vanishing cycles for this killing form. So it's just some quadratic form on some vector space and that's something that we can manage. Um, but I think if it was much more complicated, it would be uh, beyond us. So that's what I wanted to say about part um, a, um, and then I wanted to um, spend most of the time talking about the second part, part B. So, um, so in part A, we just uh, have constructed the morphism, which we want to show as an isomorphism, and we know it's Betty realization is the isomorphism of Malik and Shen. And in part B, we show it's an isomorphism. And the, the tool for doing this is um, to use a conservativity argument. So um, what's the idea here? So, well, conjecturally, it, it should be the case that if you know the Betty realization is an isomorphism and you had an actual morphism of motives, then um, that morphism of motives should be an isomorphism. Um, but um, this is known on a nice subcategory of motives called abelian motives. Um, so let me say what abelian motives are. Well, abelian motives are, um, so it's the um, thick tensor subcategory generated by motives of um, abelian varieties. So you take um, A and abelian variety, you take its motive, and this generates some category which is called the category of abelian motives. Um, and it's actually equivalent to taking the uh, motive, maybe I shouldn't call it C because C was our original one, but let's say C prime. Um, so you take any smooth projective curve and you take its motive, um, and then um, this generates the same thing. And so um, what's the conservativity result we'd like to apply? Well, it's a result of Wilder's house, which says um, that if you look at the Betty realization um, on abelian motives, so um, assume that K is a subfield of C, so you can um, then have this Betty realization, this singular cohomology, then this functor is actually conservative. So if you have a morphism here, whose Betty realization here is an isomorphism, then um, the morphism here was actually an isomorphism all along. And this is exactly what we need because we have a morphism, we have alpha gamma here, and we know that it's Betty realization um, is an isomorphism. And so this is exactly what we want to apply. So by construction, we, we've just sort of imitated everything that Malik and Shen did in their construction. Um, we know that, um, our map, its Betty realization is the isomorphism of Malik and Shen. And so we can conclude from this. So the hard work is actually this first step in proving that both sides are abelian motives. And so um, that's, that's what I want to focus on. Are there any questions maybe about the general strategy? No, okay, I will um, carry on. So yeah, this is um, the, the main part of part B is showing that the motives involved are abelian. And actually, um, before even we started this project on motivic uh, mirror symmetry for Higgs bundles, we'd actually um, proved that the motive of the GLN Higgs moduli space is abelian. So um, this was a few years ago. Um, we proved, yeah, that, um, so again, N and D are always co-prime for me. Um, but if you look at the GLN and Higgs moduli space, then we prove that its motive is actually in the category just generated by the motive of the curve. So this is the original curve C that we were working on. So it's just one fixed curve that you need. Um, and um, so here, here it's stated, it's just in this um, subcategory generated by the motive of C. And our, our proof is actually very much heavily reliant on geometric ideas of um, firstly, Nigel Hitchin, and then also, um, Garcia Prada, Heinlot, and Schmidt, who um, study the class in the growth and deep ring of varieties of the um, uh, of the Higgs uh, moduli space. 
And so uh, luckily there's enough geometric uh, sort of structure in their, their ideas that we can try and um, imitate. So actually what, what, what they do is they get a sort of recursive procedure for calculating the class in the growth unique ring of varieties of the Higgs bundle moduli space. But for us, it's, it's, it, it, it's, we can't get a formula as such. Um, so because um, essentially we don't have this splitting property that you do have for in the growth unique ring of varieties. So it's, it, it's a little bit more complicated, but morally the ideas um, uh, come from here. And, um, but the problem is that now, uh, so um, this was about GLN Higgs bundles, and now I'm talking about SLN Higgs bundles. So now we had to upgrade this theorem to SLN Higgs bundles, and you would think it would be almost the same, but that's not at all the case. So, um, and also, well, I guess as well, you also have to do D-twisted Higgs bundles. So you have a, a divisor D appearing. So the, the divisor D doesn't actually make much of a difference. It's really the SLN Higgs bundles which cause a difference. So um, for any um, uh, divisor of degree greater than or equal to 2G minus 2, we prove that the motor of the GLN Higgs bundles, D-twisted Higgs bundles, is generated by the motor of the curve. So it's the same result as this one. But when we look at SLN Higgs bundles, and again, it doesn't really matter whether you're doing the D or not, but we need it for D. Um, you, this is actually not, in general, generated by the motor for the curve. Instead, it's um, you have to add certain um, finite tile covers of your curve. Um, and um, so you need more than just the motor of your curve. So you have to enlarge this category uh, is the key point here. Uh, but it's still abelian because all, all we're looking at is motors of curves, so everything's still fine and we're still happy because that's the result that we needed. Um, so um, actually on cohomology already, this was observed in rank two for classical Higgs bundles by Hitchens. So he observed that uh, on the level of cohomology, you needed to add these uh, certain tile covers and morally they come from the fact that you need to take a root of some line bundles. So you're sort of taking some um, you're looking at the multiplication by n map on the Jacobian and you're wanting to pull back via that and that gives you this um, etal cover. So let, let me say a little bit yeah, about this, uh, the fact that this SLM Higgs moduli space is not generated by the motor of a curve. In, so actually we proved this um, together in joint work with Liu Fu. We showed that the motor of the SLM Higgs moduli, moduli space is not contained inside here. But for vector bundles, the case, it's a completely different story. So for vector bundles, the um, moduli space of GLN vector bundles, so without fixed determinant, and also the one with fixed determinants, the SLN one, are both generated by the motive of the curve. In fact, um, we have that the motive of the GLN vector bundle moduli space is a tensor product of the motive of the Jacobian and the SLN one. So. Um, this is actually a motivic version of a cohomological theorem of Harder and Narasimha. And actually, the, the, one of the key features in this is that you actually use this action of this group gamma, so the end torsion in the Jacobian, and you show that the action of gamma on, well, on the cohomology is trivial. And so we actually also lift that and we show that the action on the motive is trivial. But in, in the Higgs bundle world, the action of gamma on the cohomology and the motive is very non-trivial. So we have this decomposition given by the, the characters kappa in gamma hat and the uh, non-zero characters do index genuine non-zero pieces. So there's, there's something interesting going on here. And actually that's also a thing um, which is from this, you actually see from this, this or on the level of cohomology, you see that um, the cohomology of the SLM uh, vector bundle moduli space is, um, is generated by the tautological classes because we know that's true for GLN. And also for GLN Higgs bundles, you know that the cohomology is generated by the tautological classes, i.e. the uh, Kunith components of the Chern classes of the universal bundle but that's not true for SLN Higgs bundles. And uh, so somehow this, this gamma action is causing a lot of trouble. So, okay, um, let me just say, uh, let's go back to the two theorems. Um, uh, and let me say that, so theorem two is essentially a harder version of theorem one. So I'm just going to talk about theorem one. Um, so, uh, and maybe at the end, if I have some time, I can give some comments into a little bit more, but um, I'm going to focus on theorem one and explaining the proof of that. 
So as I said, it was uh, the first thing goes really back to Hitchin. So the first step is to use this GM action I talked about right at the beginning of the talk. So um, Hitchin uh, considered this GM action just by scaling the Higgs field. And this is what's called a semi-projective GM action. So what does that mean? It means that, um, so if this moduli space was projective, then you would always have that the limits as t goes to zero and t goes to infinity, so thinking of GM sitting inside P1 exist, but they don't necessarily. But in this case, they do if you um, flow always to zero. So it means that you can always do a deformation reflect, retract down to the fixed locus by flowing as t goes to zero. Um, and this gives you um, a, a bielanicki barula decomposition, um, which um, uh, over the fixed point locus. And the fixed point locus actually turns out to be um, a projective. Well, so you have projective varieties. Um, so what are the fixed points? So there's kind of two, two options that can happen. Either your Higgs field is actually zero, in which case E must have been a semi-stable vector bundle. So one, one component in the fixed locus, the GM fixed locus, is the moduli space of semi-stable vector bundles. And then what are the others? Well, if your Higgs field is non-zero, then you must have a, um, a copy of the multiplicative group in the automorphism group of E. And so that GM acting on E gives a uh, weight space decomposition. And actually, you can see that the Higgs field must spend, send each weight space to the next. So it must send um, E0 to E1, uh, tensored omega C, and so on. So yeah, let me maybe write it here. So this is E0. Uh, sorry, this is just E0. And then after that, you get uh, E1 tensor omega C. And uh, then F2 would be E2 tensor omega C squared, uh, and so on. And you you get a, what's called a chain of vector bundles. So you get um, vector bundles with uh, sheaf homomorphisms between them. And yeah, so what's happening here? Well, you can, as I said, you can sort of flow as t goes to zero to the fixed locus. And this fixed locus decomposes um, as moduli spaces of chains. So I'm actually thinking about the um, case where the Higgs field is zero. So that's the moduli space of semi-stable vector also being a chain. So it's sort of like a chain of length <laughs> uh, zero. Um, so there's, there's, but uh, that's just, just as um, more convenient notation. And um, these chain moduli spaces, well, they have some invariants, the tuple of ranks, so the ranks of all of these vector bundles, and the degrees, uh, this is this E. Um, and there's only finitely many tuples of ranks and degrees that appear in this decomposition. So this is um, a, a finite uh, set here that we're indexing over. And um, there's actually some sort of notion of semi-stability for chains. And actually, the, the nice thing is about chains that there's different notions of stability for chains. And this will be very important in the next part. Um, but there's one stability parameter in particular, which um, is relevant for us. And that's what I'm calling alpha H. So, oh, sorry. It's the um, Higgs stability parameter. And so it's the one such that um, semi-stability for that corresponds to semi-stability for the Higgs bundle. So that you really get this um, decomposition here. And this, I, I mean, I think this really goes back to both, well, Hitchin and Simpson kind of described this, um, this description. Uh, well, Hitchin originally in rank two, but it actually all generalized to higher rank. And um, so what this means is that um, over each fixed locus, um, you actually have um, the points which flow into it, and that's an affine bundle over it. And so um, on the level of motives, um, you actually get that the motif of the Higgs bundle moduli space is a direct sum over the motifs of these chain moduli spaces with some twists by um, co-dimensions, which are basically coming from the guys in triangles which actually split in this case. So that's one case where these distinguished triangles do split. And so the upshot of all of this is that it suffices to describe motifs of chain moduli spaces. So um, if we want to know that the motif of this is generated by the motif of the curve, it suffices to know that the motifs of these things are generated by the motif of the curve. And so that's what we um, do. Then, um, well, I guess also, um, Another thing is that we can actually pass from the moduli space to the moduli stack because 
um, the moduli stack in this case, so because semi-stability is equal to stability here, because it's true on this side, um, the moduli stack of chains, uh, semi-stable chains, is actually a GM gerb over the moduli space. And so it actually suffices to know that the motifs of the chain moduli stacks of semi-stable things are generated by the motif of the curve. And then the next step is really where we use this um, uh, work of Garcia Prada, Heinlott and Schmidt, which is they use the fact that you have this flexibility with chains, that you have uh, and different notions of stability to um, move around in your space of stability parameters and get to a stability parameter where stability is easier. So essentially they use a wall crossing argument um, on the space of uh, chain stability parameters um, to reduce um, the whole question to looking at stacks of chain homomorphisms, which are all injective and have, of constant rank. So you look like, so you have uh, vector bundles, which all have the same rank and all of the maps are uh, inclusions. So that means that the quotient is just some torsion thing. So let me try and explain how this works. Um, so firstly, um, the deformation theory for chains is best understood in, in, in some cone. I, it doesn't really matter what the description of this cone is, but um, so you can just imagine it like this. Uh, I think of this cone. And then inside there, you have this wall and chamber structure so that every time you pass one of these purple walls, the notion of semi-stability changes. Um, and the key thing is that this Higgs bundle parameter, it actually sits on the boundary of this cone, but because semi-stability is equal to stability, it's not on a wall, so you can just move away slightly and you get inside the cone. Um, and uh, I call this alpha tilde H, so it's a slight perturbation of the Higgs stability parameter, but it gives you the same notion of semi-stability. And then they, they say that when you've got a point um, inside the interior of the cone, then there's a path from this point to some point which I'm going to call alpha infinity, um, uh, where stability is basically understood in this chamber. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's two cases. If the, um, so we've got some invariants, a tuple of ranks, and if this tuple of ranks is non-constant, then actually um, the notion of semi-stability is empty, so there's no semi-stable things in this infinite chamber here. So that's very good, because we, we know how to <laughs> compute the motive of that. Um, uh, but if M is constant, then instead what you get is that um, the semi-stable locus is contained inside the stack of injective chain homomorphisms. Uh, and this is actually a union of hard and narrow and strata. So then what you need to do is, um, so we're interested in actually understanding the, the motive of the moduli space for this stability parameter, but we can try and compute it from this one because each time we cross a wall, there's going to be some sort of hard and narrow semen recursion going on and a bunch of guys in triangles. And so essentially by a sort of hard and narrow semen recursion argument uh, involving the wall crossings at each wall that you pass in this path, um, it suffices to show that the motive of this stack of injective chain homomorphisms, um, when M is uh, constant, is contained in the category generated by the motive of the curve. Um, yeah, so let's now turn to that. And this, so I, I should say that at this point, um, we can't really compute anything because each time we go over one of these walls, um, you get all of these distinguished triangles which don't necessarily split. Um, whereas in the growth and degree varieties, they do split. So this is something that becomes a lot more technically difficult for us. But we do have a formula for the motif of um, this, um, this, this, this one here. So let me give you this formula. Um, and this is really inspired by work of uh, Heinlott, which was actually based on work of Le Mans on the level of cohomology using stacks of Hecker modifications. So as I said, if you're looking at maps of injective chain homomorphisms where everything's got the same rank, then the quotient is some torsion thing. So you can think about this as a, um, an iteration of various Hecker modifications or elementary transformations. Um, and um, together with that, it also uses um, a motivic description of small maps, uh, which is um, extending work of De Cataldo and Migliorini. So let me give you the theorem um, which states the formula. And then we can talk about the proof. So if we take a constant uh, tuple of rank vectors, oh, and I see, sorry, this is a mistake. This should be an M. 
So, uh, so M i is equal to M for all i. Then um, the motive of the stack of injective chains is, um, well, firstly, we have something that's um, built from the curve, essentially. So we have, we take the curve and we cross for the projective space. We take its um, symmetric power for Li. So that's the differences between the degrees. So that's the degree of the torsion quotient that you have. Um, and then um, we see the motive of the stack of vector bundles of rank MR and degree ER. And so this whole thing here is generated by the motor of the curve. And so it would then suffice to know that this thing is generated by the motor of the curve, which actually we also know from previous work um, that we did. So I'll come to that separately, but let's first explain the proof of this theorem. So um, we consider the following picture. So on this um, injective chain thing, when you've got constant ranks, you can take um, your um, inclusions and look at their successive quotients. And these are torsion sheaves of degree Li. So they are torsion coherent sheaves now. And I'm also going to remember the last sheaf. So this is where we get this copy of Bun actually. And then you have a support map from there going to um, a product of um, symmetric curve, symmetric powers of your curve. And the idea really goes back to Le Mans, which is he was interested in calculating the cohomology of um, this. And one way in which you can do it is to um, look at a flag version of this. So this is this tilde, where rather than looking at a degree Li coherent sheaf, uh, torsion sheaf, um, you instead consider a, a flag of torsion sheaves where each um, Tj is of degree J. So at each stage in this flag, you're just increasing the degree by one. Then um, uh, this turns out to be much easier to compute its cohomology of, and this map here is actually a small map. Um, and actually it's um, a, so just, just on the level of uh, one particular one, it's a, um, on a dense open, it's a torsor for the symmetric group on Li elements, because you can basically take the, um, the support of your torsion thing, um, which will be Li points. And if those Li points are distinct points, then um, you can permute them. And that's essentially what this, this action is doing, uh, this action of the symmetric group. Um, yeah, so you can also do a flag version of this stack of injective chains where now, so before you have these inclusions and the degree jumped by Li at each stage, but now we're just gonna let the degree jump by one at each stage. So you're sort of refining this filtration here into a, a much larger filtration. Uh, and then that fits into a commutative diagram uh, here. Um, and um, I'm going to call this Gruer tilde. So it's like taking the associated graded again and sub tilde um, because, and now this lands in a product of curves rather than symmetric powers uh, of the curve. Um, so the point then is that if we consider this composition, so this blue map, then um, this is actually um, an iterated uh, projective bundle. Um, so because what you're doing is you're just doing a, an elementary Hecker modification. So you're just taking a vector bundle of rank M and you're taking a point and you want to construct um, uh, an elementary Hecker modification. Well, then that's actually equivalent to giving a subjection from the fiber at P to your field K. And so that's just a point in um, a projective space of dimension uh, M minus one. And so, and you're doing this uh, this many times. So each time you're getting a, a projective bundle over this um, thing here. And that's good news because we know how to compute motifs of projective bundles. So um, then the motif of um, uh, this thing here by the projective bundle formula is then the motif of uh, this. And I'm actually going to package these in with the projective spaces and then tensor um, a bunch of copies of um, the motives of C crossed by this PM minus one. And um, so now we, we know the motive of this, but actually I was interested in the motive of this. And it turns out this map is also small. And so we would like to try and relate these two motives. And so then the idea is um, that there's now a product of symmetric groups acting on a dense open such that um, uh, this map becomes a torsor so this forgetful map becomes a torsor under that product of symmetric groups. 
And because it's a small map, essentially the, the extra part where it's not a torso doesn't contribute. So it turns out that the motif of the um, injective chain homomorphisms is then given by the uh, equivariant piece um, for this, sorry, the invariant piece for this um, symmetric group um, of the flag version. So the motif of the flag version. And then, well, you just look at this formula here and you can sort of see what's going on. So we have Li copies of C crossed by Pn minus one, and then we're quotienting by the symmetric group. So you're going to get the um, uh, symmetric powers of these um, appearing here. And so that gives the formula. I should say um, that here um, to take this um, piece, um, which is invariant under the symmetric group, you need to invert its order. But actually we need to do that for basically all, well, we need to do it for many different symmetric groups. So in fact, it's just, this is where we, we're kind of forced to work with um, rational coefficients because you, you want to invert the orders of all symmetric groups. Um, yeah, let me, so to complete the argument now, because let's go back to the formula, um, we want to know that this is generated by the motor of the curve and this is generated by the motor of the curve. So the question mark is, is this generated by the motor of the curve? And that's the last step in this argument. So um, this is um, finally, we prove an explicit formula for the stack of um, vector bundles on a curve. And this is, uh, again, very nice. So it's lots of things which are just to do with motors of curves. Well, of the, the original curve that we started with. So you have the Jacobian, the motor of the Jacobian, and the motive of the classifying stack of the multiplicative group. So actually, you can think about this as being like the motive of um bun gm so like um rank one vector bundles and then you have a um tensor product of um zeta functions for your curve which look like um so they're taking their infinite sums of most of symmetric powers of your curve and then there's some tape twists but in particular, the important thing is that everything here is just generated by the motive of the curve so um indeed the motive is um sitting in this category where it's generated by the motor of the curve. And that completes the proof that the motor of the Higgs bundle moduli space is generated by the motor of the curve. So I've got two more minutes. So I just um, say two words about the proof really. Um, so I have a, a, a very um, schematic diagram of what's going on in the proof. So the idea is um, to sort of rigidify um, by, um, instead of working with a stack, you work with a um, in scheme, which is actually, you look at sort of torsion quotients um, of some particular rank M vector bundle. Um, and this involves actually fixing a, a rational point on your curve. And um, so the you want to choose it, um, set everything up in such a way that uh, the kernel here has degree E. And so then you're just forgetting, you're just doing this forgetful map to go to here. And this is almost a vector bundle, this map, this first map. And so it's and it's close enough to being a vector bundle that the motif of this is the same as the motif of this. So then it suffices to compute the motif of this. But the, the challenging thing here was that on the level of um, motifs, we didn't understand the natural transition maps between these, which is what you would need to do to compute this motif. So in fact, we also replaced it by a flag version. So just like we did in the case of injective chain homomorphisms, we replaced it by a flag version. And this also turned out to be a small map. And so this, this step here was really um, uh, similar to what we just did. And so then you can compute the motive of this from the motive of this, which is now computable. And um, that's what we did to get this formula as well. That's how to explain <laughs> this formula in two minutes. Um, okay, so I think this is a good place to stop, I think. So um, thank you very much for listening.